Great, thank you. Um, thank you everybody for coming. Um, so it's my distinct pleasure to welcome Dr. Emma Hodcroft today. Emma will be presenting on her work in mapping the spread and evolution of SARS-CoV-2 through phylogenetics. Of course, we're all impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, especially as new mutations arise that can lead to more transmissible, more immune evasive variants as we'll hear about now. Our speaker is a highly influential molecular epidemiologist at the Institute for Social and Preventative Medicine at the University of Bern. Although she is perhaps best known for her work on SARS-CoV-2, her expertise extends beyond that to include many pathogens, including tuberculosis and HIV. Her PhD thesis was obtained from the University of Edinburgh, working with Professor Andrew Leigh Brown with a focus on virulence and HIV. Emma also co-developed NextStrain, an online tool to visualize genetics and spread of viruses, which became really indispensable in understanding the spread of SARS-CoV-2 globally. Um, in addition to her leadership in understanding the evolution and spread of SARS-CoV-2, Emma has also played a really important and influential role in public communication during the COVID-19 pandemic. Notably, during the rise of the Alpha variant, Emma provided context on the key mutations and geographic spread through her Twitter feed, um, and she continues to play an important role in uh, public communication um, now. So thanks again, Emma, for joining us today. I, I turn the floor over to you, and I'm looking forward to, to your talk. So thank you so much for that really kind introduction and for the opportunity to speak here today, which is really wonderful. And thank you everyone for, for showing up on a, on a Thursday afternoon. And as was already said, so I'm gonna talk today um, a bit about kind of how we track, how we use phylogenetics to track variants, why we decide something's a variant, focusing a little bit on Omicron because that is of course what we're in the midst of at the moment and what that means for the future. But I also wanted to not talk too long today because I wanted to make sure there was chance for discussion and questions, particularly with this group in particular, um, if there was questions about next strain or phylogenetics or some of the other work I've done with entire viruses or, or other things. So I wanted to try and leave some time for that. So anyway, so, but to focus back on the pandemic as I think we, we still often are these days, I think one thing that is really not debatable is how much sequencing has absolutely played a role in this pandemic and how it's revolutionized how we've handled an outbreak like this of an infectious disease. And we have seen an absolute revolution, not only in how much data has been generated, but how it has been shared openly. We now have over 10 million sequences for SARS-CoV-2, and that blows everything else out of the water, even for influenza, which is probably the next most sequenced path, um, pathogen, well, possibly HIV is next, but it's really hard to say because it's kept in different databases. Um, influenza is probably next, and that's about 300,000 sequences. So it really is almost unimaginable two years ago that we would ever have this many sequences, but it has allowed us to get where we are with multiple effective vaccines, with being able to track how SARS-CoV-2 spread initially, and of course, for things like tracking and identifying mutations and variants, which is most of what we're doing today. And the way that this works, just to give a very brief overview, is that when a pathogen moves through a population and transmits from person to person, it of course acquires mutations, shown here as these colored diamonds. And when we sequence these individuals, we sample them and we sequence them, we can actually see these mutations in the genome, shown here just as this solid black line with these colored diamonds on it. And we can use this to very quickly start getting a picture of how different samples are related to other, whether they share more mutations or don't share mutations, and this is what we use to create the basic phy phylogeny or viral family tree, which allows us to essentially reconstruct an approximation of that original transmission history. And of course, on top of this, because we know when and where viral samples were taken, we can also use trees like this and we can extend them to have a better understanding, not only how the virus changed over time as far as mutations, but how it has spread globally or within a region and how that's happened over time. So we can use, we can make these trees time scaled as well. And all of these things, of course, have been critical for what we've done in the pandemic, even from those early days of seeing how SARS-CoV-2 spread out of Asia. And of course, more recently, seeing how different variants have also spread from different regions of the world. And it is because of these mutations, so this is kind of an extension of the same idea, but without showing every spike mutation for each of the variants, we of course have a very unique set of mutations that identify these and that have allowed us to track them. So to first identify them, and then to see how they've spread around the world. And this of course is not just true, I'm just showing the variants of concern here, but it's also true for the variants of interest and for the many, many lineages that exist now and have existed in the past that scientists keep an eye on, 
or uh, monitor and then decide are not really not really concerning. And we can see this if we look just very briefly, I think this is a kind of just a neat animation showing how the different variants of concern have appeared and spread around the world from the first one that was identified alpha at the end of 20, 20 at the end of 2020 beginning of 2021 to beta in South America, gamma in South sorry, beta in South Africa, gamma in South America to delta which absolutely dominated and really pushed out most other variants. And then this graphic is a little outdated, but you can still already start to see the rise of Omicron, which now, of course, would be much more complete in, in the last few months and weeks. But there are, of course, many, many mutations that can take place as a virus is spreading through a population. And so definitely one question that we've had to make decisions about in the last few years is when do we believe that we have a new variant? And we certainly don't have concrete answers to this today, but mostly what we've looked at is changes in the epidemiology. And in particular, historically, we looked for changes in case numbers. So if we saw case numbers start to rise in a particular area, we would often start looking to see whether this was something that might be associated with the virus. But of course, as we know now very clearly that it isn't always, it can be caused by changes in restrictions or changes in behavior, seasonality, super spreader events. And we actually saw a really good example of this last autumn with Delta. Delta was already prevalent across Europe, but we still saw in many places in Europe a very distinct wave, a rise in cases in the autumn, not because of a new variant, it was the same Delta we'd had previously, but because most likely of seasonality combined with changes in restrictions and behavior. Um, of course, then we saw another bigger wave when Omicron came in. And so this is why not only do we look for changes in epidemiological factors, but also mutations in the virus. So can we associate a change that we see in the epidemiology of the virus with particular mutations. Um, one thing that's really interesting with Omicron is that we actually managed to do this a little bit backwards. So for most of the variants, we saw changes in epidemiology, and then we started to notice that these were associated with mutations in the virus that seemed to be linked and, and causal, eventually shown to be causal between the two. But actually with Omicron, to really highlight how much sequencing we've done and how much we've learned about the virus, but, um, people who spend a lot of time like Tom Peacock and other scientists around the world looking at new sequences that come in actually flagged Omicron very early on because of the mutations. So we actually saw mutations that were associated with potentially concerning changes in the virus before we actually saw the epidemiological rise in cases in South Africa. And this is hopefully a testament for what we will be able to do maybe better in the future is identifying variants very early on from an early sequence. Of course, whether a variant then goes on to be successful, we at least yet cannot you know, absolutely prove from a sequence, but being able to flag this better and have early alerts for this is almost certainly will help us to be better prepared. And of course, it's probably worth pointing out when we talk about mutations with SARS-CoV-2, we very often are focusing on mutations in the spike protein. Um, and in particular, we, we're often concerned about mutations in this top part of spike. So spike is actually divided into two regions, the S1 and S2. And this is essentially because spike gets broken apart and put back together again when it's being made. And some of the regions that are very important or that where mutations have been identified that seem to be very important are this um, boundary, the S1, S2 boundary, and then the receptor binding domain that is here at the top. That's the part that actually attaches to cells and is also a really important epitope, so important for our immune recognition. And then the N-terminal domain, which is this kind of shoulder part that's also really important for immune recognition. And these are often the areas where we've seen mutations that have been associated with changes in virus behavior. And this is why we often hear so, many, so much focus on spike mutations, though it's notable that there has been um, recently, there have been more papers looking at what mutations in other parts of the virus seem to do, which is also really critical, but in general is often harder because we just have a better idea of what spike mutations do. And so when do we really decide, you know, when we see these mutations, we see changes in epidemiology in one order or the other, when do we really decide that something is a variant of concern? Well, mostly what we're interested in, particularly for the WHO definition, is things that impact how we're going to handle the pandemic. So in particular, changes in how transmissible the virus is, changes in the immune evasion or the vaccine efficacy, and changes in clinical outcomes. So how, you know, how many bad outcomes, how many mortality, how much mortality do we see from this variant? But on top of this, we also are really interested in things like is this variant expanding? So do we actually see that this variant is growing? Do we, do we just see it in one or two people or is it actually seem to be increasing in frequency? Is it spreading? 
So do we just see it in one country or are we seeing it being able to invade into other countries as well or other regions in the world? And then finally, is it out competing other variants? So is this something that we only see somewhere where they essentially have cases well under control or is it able to break into areas where other variants of SARS-CoV-2 are circulating? And these are really important as well because we have actually seen lineages of SARS-CoV-2 in the past and I'm sure we'll continue to see more in the future where the mutations may point to something and even direct observations may point to something that seems concerning or might have traits that we don't necessarily want. But if we only see it in one town or one country and it doesn't seem like it can spread much further, though it of course might still be very much of, of a concern to that place and it still might be incredibly scientifically interesting, it's not necessarily going to be considered the next variant of concern because it's probably not going to be something that a lot of people have to worry about. But of course, all of this, trying to decide what a variant of concern is, trying to decide how concerning something is when we first detect sequences, is really trying to predict complex outcomes from imperfect data. And it's meant working really at the edge of what we know about SARS-CoV-2 with unprecedented amounts of data coming in. So this is probably going to change in the near future. But at the moment, we get over 20,000 sequences of SARS-CoV-2 every single day. That's an insane amount of data that scientists are trying to go through at a rate that it's not just like, oh, well, we'll get to this eventually and we'll let you know in three years that there was a new variant. Obviously, this is also, also something we're trying to do in a time scale that we can help to inform public health decisions and inform the scientific community and, you know, and world at large, whether we see something that's concerning or needs more monitoring or investigation. And so this really does prevent, you know, present very real challenges that as scientists, We've never really had to face problems of this scale of data or this speed in trying to analyze it that, that we've had before. And it, it unfortunately presents problems that seem really basic, but it can be really blocking. So if any of you have tried to download all of the genomes of SARS-CoV-2, I mean, just the size of the files poses a huge problem to a lot of pipelines because they're enormous. We never, never imagined having to process this much data or even to have to transfer it. For many countries where internet access is not so reliable, getting a hold of this data alone is now a challenge because they don't have good enough internet to download this before another 20,000 sequences have come in. So these are challenges that we, we've never really had to face before, but that we're trying to overcome as a scientific community. But what I wanted to kind of then turn to is an idea of kind of, okay, we, we track these variants. We actually have a pretty good system for doing this. We've certainly improved a lot about how well we can flag things that might be of concern, but where does this, where do we stand today and how, what does that mean looking forward? And so to me, that really means we have to take a look at Omicron because this is what has, of course, come to dominate in the past few months. Um, and it's worth saying, it's worth maybe emphasizing, I feel like this graphic doesn't show it as clearly as, as it might, unfortunately, but actually multiple of these greens are Delta, only two of them are labeled. And at the peak of Delta's dominance, over 99% of sequences that we were getting in every day from all over the world were Delta. It had really managed to push out almost everything else in a way that even though it felt like Alpha was really dominant here in Europe, it actually didn't make as strong inroads in the rest of the world, um, or at least it varied from region to region. Delta really did just take over the world. And it felt very much like Delta would be the last variant or whatever came next would be a child of Delta. And of course, then in November, out of the blue, out of left field, Omicron came and it has now taken on a very similar path. So um, it's still growing in many countries and sequencing data is always delayed, but certainly it's you know very effectively pushed out everything else in, in Europe and in North America. And we expect to see a very similar pattern in other countries as well. But as we've learned, it's not necessarily, that doesn't necessarily mean there's nothing else out there. I see you've got your hand raised, Martin. Do you want to? Yeah, um, it's okay if um, we interrupt with questions. Yeah, of course. So um, how does competition mainly work? Is it direct competition between strains for susceptible hosts? Or is it via um, a policy change? So um, Omicron um, increasing, then restrictions being uh, increased in response and this driving Delta out. So I think it is mostly direct competition. And I think particularly for the variants for Delta and for BA1 and BA2, which I'm gonna talk about a little more in, in, in a minute, a lot of this just comes straight from transmissibility. If you can transmit to more people faster, you're gonna win the race essentially. 
And we can see this actually very clearly with BA1 and BA2, because you're right, from Delta to Omicron, there was some, some at least some places strengthened restrictions or at least didn't roll back restrictions. <laughs> it's often kind of all we hope for these days. Um, but between BA1 and BA2, things actually in many countries either relaxed or didn't change at all. And BA2 is still really dominant. This graph again is a little outdated, but BA2 is really dominating over BA1. So I think a lot of this is really just direct competition that these variants went out on, or at least the most recent two. So one of the things about Omicron that, that you may have heard or that you may already know is that it's really distinct as a variant because it sits on what we call a long branch. So this is a kind of an exploded view of a phylogeny where the ancestral SARS-CoV-2 is in the middle and then all of the other variants come, come out. And th again, this, tr this tree doesn't show a perfect view of this, but for most other variants, even though they may not be highlighted and kind of be shown nicely, we do have samples that go back along these branches that help give us an idea of the history of the variant. So they might be samples where the variant doesn't have all of the mutations that you know, later became the set of mutations that made Delta Delta, for example. But we have some idea of what order these mutations were acquired in. And in some cases, we know where that variant was circulating kind of as it became the variant that it would be one day. But for Omicron, this branch really is just as long and as naked as this picture shows. We really have no idea what was happening evolutionarily um, during this long time where it really almost goes back to almost, you know, it, it's, its common ancestor with the rest of SARS-CoV-2 was, was a very long time ago, it seems like. And this means that it's much harder for us to tell how it evolved or where it evolved. And of course, there's been a lot of theories about this. So for example, there's some speculation it might have evolved in an immunocompromised individual. And the reason people think this is that if you, if you don't have um, a really good immune system, of course, then you might be that uh, the virus, you, you can't clear it as quickly. So you have SARS-CoV-2, instead of just for a couple of weeks, you might have it for weeks or months. And unfortunately, this is a bit of a classic case of what doesn't kill you can make you stronger. The virus is living in a partially functioning immune system and can potentially learn how to get around that since it's not being killed. Now, very important to say, this doesn't happen in every immunocompromised patient, not by far. And it doesn't necessarily mean that whatever the virus kind of whatever selection pressures the virus responds to in that person doesn't necessarily mean that it will come out with mutations that work in other people with healthy immune systems. But it does at least we, from other um, evolution that we've seen in, for example, in you know, compromised people where we track them over time, it does seem like this is at least a possibility. But of course, Omicron was also first detected in Africa. And we also know that, for example, there's much less accessibility for sequencing in Africa. So it's also possible that Omicron was circulating and evolving somewhere where we would just have never sampled it for a very long time because there really isn't molecular surveillance in many countries, not just in Africa, but around the world, but particularly in Africa where we think Omicron came from. And then there's also been a lot of discussion about animal reservoirs. So the possibility that Omicron jumped into some animal host and then jumped back into people. Uh, this is certainly a, a theory. I think, unfortunately, it's something that is always worth chatting a little about just because I think it's very popular in the media and I think we often get this idea certainly in a movie you know if it goes into animals and comes back that's always a terrible sign in reality of course you could have a mutation happen in an animal reservoir that might mean bad news for humans but it isn't a given and we actually saw this with the if you remember the Danish mink at the end of 2020 um, the SARS-CoV-2 that jumped into those mink became very mink adapted but actually when it jumped back into people it didn't do very well so as you might expect, what works really well in one animal doesn't automatically make you more dangerous for another. It's a possibility, but it doesn't, it isn't always true. But of course, finally, I think it's important to remember that it could also be a combination of these things. So it could be that, you know, undetected circulation meant that the virus was able to um, move through immunocompromised populations, for example, which we know exist in Africa, unfortunately, because of the HIV outbreak. And it, you know, it could have been even animals involved as well. Unfortunately, until we have, if we ever have more ancestral sequences of Omicron, I think it's very hard to tell which of these may or may not have happened. It's, it's a lot of speculation without having more samples. And one of the reasons that Omicron was flagged straight away is because as well as, well as kind of sticking out so much on the tree on that long branch, if we focus on the number of mutations that it has in this top part of spike, so this is a phylogeny where on the x-axis I'm showing the sample date, but on the y-axis I'm actually just showing the number of mutations in the S1 region. That's the top with the receptor binding domain and the N-terminal domain. 
Omicron absolutely stands out well above what we've seen in every other variant. And this, of course, was a big a bit of a red flag because a lot of these mutations at this S1 site we know are associated with things like increased cell binding and immune evasion. And this is part of what really got scientists looking at Omicron even from those early days. And one thing that I've glossed over a little bit, brought it up a little bit, glossed over a little bit, is that, of course, Omicron is, is a little bit complicated. Omicron is not just one thing. Um, Omicron is the name of a family, but it involves different lineages as well. So most well-known of these are called BA1 and BA2. In next strain, we call them 21K and 21L. And these are kind of different sisters within this Omicron family. They're certainly more related to each other. They're all very distinctly Omicron, but they're also quite different. So the number of mutations is shown here on the x-axis, and they do still differ quite significantly from each other as well. BA1 is the one that we first detected and it started spreading in November. So if you were hearing about Omicron around Christmas time, early January, it was BA1 that people were talking about. We actually detected BA2 pretty soon after BA1, but it, it looked like it was a bit of a dud. It wasn't taking off. We weren't seeing many sequences of it until about the end of January when it started to spread quite a lot and quite quickly. And now of course, BA2 is what is taking over and has actually come to dominate across most of Europe and is very quickly dominating around the rest of the world as well. There's a third lineage, BA3, but this one does seem, we, we just don't see many sequences of it. It doesn't seem to be expanding. So you don't hear much about BA3 because it just doesn't seem like it can compete against its two sisters, BA1 and BA2. Interestingly, BA2 is one that was picked up first. It was started, started to be picked up, but it was spreading in Scandinavian and Nordic countries. So at the kind of beginning of January, middle of January, uh, countries like Denmark and Sweden started saying that they were seeing quite a lot of BA2. At the same time, we were also seeing it rise in South Africa, but interestingly, after BA1 had already dominated. So we still aren't really sure why BA2 had this lag before it started to spread more widely, but certainly now we can see very clearly. So if I just flip back and forth, this is, sorry, this is from Covariance, a website that I manage. And it's showing kind of at the end of January what things look like. And then I can fast forward to, I think this is the, the middle of March, 2022. And you can see how quickly BA2 really started to dominate in most countries. And now it, again, this is a little out of date, but this is the picture is not really changed because it's really hitting bottom here. And now in countries like the US as well, we can see how much BA2 is dominating. And it's similar in Switzerland. This graph is a, a couple of weeks out of date. I think we're more like 90%, 10%. So 90% BA2 and 10% BA1 now, um, BA2 is really starting to dominate. And so I think this raises, of course, interesting questions about, okay, we know these are both Omicron, but what is the actual difference that we see between BA1 and BA2? And there's just some, some great graphics from outbreak.info that show mutation changes between these two lineages. So if they have purple, they have the mutation, and if they have white, then they don't. So if they both have purple, they both have the mutation, if they don't, then they, they have a difference at that site. And we can look at this for some kind of random genes that we don't hear much about, ORF1 and ORF1A and ORF1B, that certainly seem to indicate that yes, there are, there are clear differences here. They don't always have the same mutations. But of course, what we're always really interested in with SARS-CoV-2 is the spike gene. And here I've marked the different regions. So the N-terminal domain, receptor binding domain, and the S1-S2 boundary. And what's quite interesting here, I think, is that if you look at this end of spike, so kind of the middle of the receptor binding domain to the end of spike, the two are actually quite similar. They, they share a lot of this purple. But if we look at the other end of spike, the end terminal domain and the first half of the receptor binding domain, you'll see there's a lot more mismatches. So they have a lot more differences. And this certainly suggests the possibility that these two might have some different properties. We know these are very important both for cell binding and for immune recognition. And so is there a chance that perhaps these don't always have the same properties when it comes to things, especially I think like immune recognition, are changes in these areas perhaps impacting how well our immune systems recognize them? But one of the first things that people started to look at, which we've already touched on a little bit, is how these variants differ both from previous variants and from each other. And there's a really nice study um, from Denmark that really showed this well looking at the secondary attack rate. So that's essentially a measure of how many people you infect if you're, if you're infected yourself. And you can see Delta here plotted in purple, BA1 above that in blue, and BA2 above that in red. And so this really shows quite well the 
a pattern that matches what we've observed with how well these variants have taken over from each other. That Delta itself is fairly transmissible. Unfortunately, there's, there's no wild type or, or other variants on here. This was all that was circulating in Denmark at the time. And then BA1 is more transmissible than Delta. And BA2 is, again, more transmissible than BA1. And this matches, as I said, with what we see in how quickly these variants have been able to push each other out, probably, as, as we kind of spoke about earlier, just through direct competition and being able to transmit faster. But of course, the other thing that people were very concerned about is exactly what I talked about a minute ago with these differences in mutations along these key epitopes and what this means for immune escape. And certainly the first data that we saw on Omicron was concerning because it showed that when we look at neutralization titers and people who've had two doses of a vaccine, you know, it works pretty well against wild type, fairly well against Delta, and really not very well at all against Omicron. The good news, of course, was that with a booster, you can recover some of this neutralization. So it never goes as high for Omicron as it does for Delta and wild type, but certainly seemed like it was well enough to protect against severe outcomes. And this is a very early paper on Omicron. So here, when they say Omicron, they mean BA1. And of course, as BA2 started spreading, the next question was, is this the same for BA2? Or are these mutations at these, these key epitope sites going to change the game here? And thankfully, the data that we have so far on BA1 and BA2 suggests that it's quite similar. So this is a very similar graph. But it's instead of um, just showing Omicron, we've got it divided into BA1 and BA2. And you can see here that with, with uh, before the booster, this neutralization is not very good, but it's recovered very similarly to what we see here after the booster, both for BA1 and BA2. Excuse me. They also looked at um, immunity from people that have been vaccinated. Well, all of these people were vaccinated. This person wasn't and just seems to be having a bad time. But in general, so these are vaccinated people who'd had BA1. And then they tested their neutralization against wild type BA1 and BA2. Wild type, of course, we would expect this is quite good for the individuals that were vaccinated, and it is. For BA1, it's also fairly good, as we would expect if you've seen BA1, and very thankfully, also seems to be very good neutralization against BA2. So all of this suggests that having BA1 and, uh, and having BA2 offers at least some kind of cross-protection, at least for some degree of, of severe disease, if not, if not potentially infection. And there has also been some interesting data looking at the possibility of reinfection if you've had BA1 and BA2, and interestingly, I've certainly heard a lot of anecdotes about this, about people getting one and getting the other, leading to some speculation that reinfection is more common, at least from the early studies that have been done so far. It does still seem like it's quite rare. If you've had one, if you've had BA1 or BA2, your chance of getting the other doesn't seem to be extremely high. Um, but of course, people don't, unless you're in a study, you don't know what variant you had, and which, one, which one was circulating. But at least in studies so far, it does seem like there is cross protection between these two to some degree. And of course, the final kind of good news that we had about Omicron is that it does seem like the hospitalization risk of Omicron and the mortality risk is much lower. Now, this is controlling for vaccine status. So this does seem, I think we can say quite confidently now, that Omicron does seem to genuinely have fewer bad outcomes than we've seen with previous variants. But I also think it's really important to say that that does not mean that Omicron is mild. I think calling it a mild variant is, can be really misleading. And we've actually seen this, unfortunately, very recently in how differently the Omicron wave affected different countries. So very thankfully here in Switzerland, the Omicron wave in general, we didn't see much increased pressure on our hospital systems, which is wonderful. In America, the first Omicron wave, BA1, put a lot of pressure on some hospital systems. And even more recently, we've seen that the Omicron wave, again, you know, same variant, but when it's gone to Hong Kong, it absolutely has, has caused huge, huge problems with hospitalizations and with mortality. And the main difference seems to be vaccination rate. So it's misleading to say that Omicron on its own is mild or something that shouldn't be worried about. The vaccines are still making a huge difference, especially for elderly and, and uh, vulnerable populations. And in areas where those vaccine rates aren't as high, we've seen the damage that Omicron can do. So all of this, I think, is kind of leading up to you know, the question on everybody's lips and the question in every news article at the moment is what does this mean for the future? You know, can we say the pandemic is over? Can we say that things will be easier now? Will we have another variant? If I could answer any of these questions for sure, I would be, I don't know, a professor, a Nobel Prize winner somewhere. I unfortunately can't, 
But what I think we can look at is kind of digging in a little bit to some of these questions. So for example, I think it's died down a little bit now, but certainly when Omicron was first becoming, um, when it became apparent that it was much more transmissible and it seemed like that it might have less, uh, less hospitalization risk, I think there was a lot of talk about is Omicron the end of the pandemic? Because after this, everyone will have either been vaccinated or had Omicron or both. So everyone will have some immunity. And so we can just you know, go on with our lives. SARS-CoV-2 will be over, all will be good. And certainly if you had a vaccine or if you had any infection with any variant, your protection against SARS-CoV-2 will be better than if you've never had anything. That is absolutely true, particularly when we take into account things like, like T cell immunity, which is much harder to measure through the types of, of graphs I've shown you. But it's also worth noting that protection, of course, between variants is not equal. So this graph's a little bit complicated, but I think it's really interesting. And what they're looking at here is essentially they have vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals in green and in purple, and they have their immunity um, against Omicron when they were first enrolled and then after being infected with Omicron. So for example, for the vaccinated group, we know that if you've been vaccinated, your immunity against Omicron is not fantastic. Um, but after you've had Omicron, unsurprisingly, your immunity against Omicron goes up. And the same is true for if you're unvaccinated. So again, your immunity before, beforehand is not nothing to write home about, but after you've been vaccinated, your immunity against Omicron goes up. What's interesting here is that they then also looked at your immunity against Delta. So for the vaccinated group, this comes out much like we would expect because we know the vaccine works quite well against Delta. So they've been vaccinated, they already have pretty good protection against Delta, and it maybe goes up slightly just from the immune kind of boosting effect that you get from being infected, even though it wasn't with Delta, it was with Omicron. But essentially you have high immunity before, high immunity after. For the unvaccinated group though, we don't see a trend like you do in these other three graphs. Their protection against Delta before and after having Omicron is not changed very much. It might have gone up slightly. And it's, I mean, I wanna be very clear that having any kind of infection will give you some protection against SARS-CoV-2 infection. As I said, particularly if we look at things, this is only measuring antibodies. And of course we know that the immune system is much more complicated than that. But I also think this is a very good reminder that having one version of SARS-CoV-2 does not necessarily protect you equally from all future or past variants of SARS-CoV-2. And so we just want to be very careful when we talk about things like everyone's been vaccinated or everyone's been infected, that that might mean quite different things as far as protection. That, and we just want to make sure that we don't make blanket statements like everyone's been infected now and so everyone is protected especially if we want to get into even more complicated things like immune waning. And when we think about the fact that we don't necessarily know what variant might come next or how it will be related to the variants that we've already seen or that we've vaccinated. And in particular, this is worth keeping in mind because so far, no variant of concern has come from another variant of concern. So this is a kind of schematic diagram showing the uh, phylogeny of SARS-CoV-2 at the time. And I've highlighted the variants of concern in red and you can see none of these come from another red box. Each of these has come from a completely different part of the tree. And often, it, you know, in the case of Delta and Omicron, a very unexpected part of the tree. And so far, even when we've had variants that have dominated like Delta, when I absolutely was saying, yes, I think the next variant will, will be something that's come from Delta, we got Omicron instead. And so I think it's very important to remain kind of remembering that we don't necessarily know where the next variant of concern will come from. It could come from Omicron. It could come from something that's circulating right now that we haven't seen yet, or that might acquire more mutations and become something more dangerous. Another way of looking at this that I think is really interesting is to look at the antigenic space projections. So these are a bit, um, I don't know, they're always a bit interesting graphs because the axes are not super meaningful as far as units. But essentially, it's taking differences in the antigenic similarity. So essentially, how similar we think your body can recognize different variants of SARS-CoV-2 if we plot them in space. And so, for example, on this one, wild type's in the middle, alpha is quite nearby, gamma and beta a little bit up here, delta over here, and Omicron over here. This was an early graph, and so this is, this is BA1. But it really highlights how much off the left field, or I guess right field in this sense, Omicron is. This one, I'm aware that it's sideways. And the reason I put it sideways is because then it maps a little better to this one. So again, we've got kind of wild type in the middle here. We've got delta down here. We've got um, beta and gamma over here. 
And here they've actually divided out Omicron BA1 and BA2, which is interesting because they've separated these quite a lot. So far, it seems like antigenically they're similar, but this is again, I mean, a lot of this work is still ongoing. But the real take home message I think from these is a reminder that we don't know how big this antigenic space is. Now, certainly some of this will not be accessible. This will not be fit enough. You know, there will be antigenic spaces here that are either not fit enough to be competitive or are just impossible, you know, for, for some biological reason. But we don't know where those spaces are. We don't know how wide this space is. And we don't know where a variant might fall next. It might be that it's over here. It might be that it's back over here, or it could be that it's way over there. And this, of course, would all mean very different things as far as how protected we are and how we might need to update vaccines, or particularly, you know, if you were infected with Omicron and the next variant is way over here, that infection may help you even less than, than we might think it would today. And a lot of this unknown comes from the fact that we're still in this phase of SARS-CoV-2 where the virus is actively adapting to figuring out how to be the best virus it can be in humans. Most viruses that we study are ones that, at least many viruses that we study, are ones that have been in humans for a long time. So they are adapted. And we see patterns that are somewhat predictable. So for example, in influenza, we see these really beautiful ladder-like evolution. I always, I don't know why we call it ladder-like. I think it's clearly stairs. But anyway, we see this very clear pattern where over time, this is a 12-year seasonal influenza tree, we can see the virus making very distinct changes in a, in a kind of direction. And where the variant that circulated in the season before very often leads to the variant that will circulate next. Now there's obvious exceptions to this. Uh, biology is never perfect. And of course, it's never quite as easy as you can make it sound when you speak. So for example, looking at what's circulating now, is the next variant that makes it big, will it be this one or this one or this one, you know, picking these vaccine strains um, it, we're not perfect, as you guys know, or else we would all have perfect flu vaccines and you wouldn't have had flu any time in the last 10 years. But we do have some idea of where the next variants might come from in the tree because the virus is evolving antigenically to reinfect us, to get away from the reaction that, it, that previous variants have evoked. So flu is pretty much optimized for being the most transmissible that it can be, at least in a seasonal context. And what it's mainly working on is evolving a little bit antigenically, making a little step so that it can reinfect us. And that means we do have some sense of how flu goes, at least seasonal flu. Of course, pandemic flu is, a, is another kettle of fish. But if you compare this tree to what we see with SARS-CoV-2, now, of course, the time scale is different, but the pattern is also completely different. This is more what we would call bursting, where we don't have a clear sense of what the next variant will come from. And there's not really a clear indication that the main driver of evolution, at least in all kind of quadrants, is just small antigenic changes to allow reinfection. For example, as I already showed you with Delta BA1 and BA2, increasing transmissibility is still a big win. The virus has still been able to optimize on that more and more. Whereas for flu, this is probably about as good as it gets for seasonal influenza. And one thing that is a big unknown is we don't know if the virus still has more tricks up its sleeve can it still evolve to something that is yet more transmissible? Or will it settle down now into um, mostly just trying to make small antigenic changes? Or will it come across some pattern that blows away all existing immunity? So a big antigenic jump that might also be somewhere else on the tree and might really cancel out some of the, some of the existing immunity that we have. We just don't know because we don't know how much space left the virus has to evolve. So for me, the, the take home really from the pandemic so far is to keep in mind that the pandemic has thrown the unexpected at us so many times. We've had so many people who've announced that the pandemic is over, that there won't be any variants, that Delta is the last variant, that Omicron is the last variant. And at least so far, these have all been wrong. And so to me, it's very important that we remain humble in keeping in mind that we've never observed a pathogen go from pandemic to endemic on a global scale like this with this amount of of molecular detail. And so we really don't have much to draw on when it comes to predicting what, what pressures the virus is facing and how this might affect what might come next. It's also important to remember, of course, that when we talk about the end of the pandemic, a lot of people are really referring to, you know, is it endemic yet? Endemic means predictable and stable, which I think we hopefully can agree that's not SARS-CoV-2 right now. We've had multiple waves in the last few months that 
we wouldn't have predicted because of new variants. And this also means that we don't necessarily know when we'll see another wave. From what we have right now, I think most scientists would say in the autumn because that's seasonal pattern. But if we see another variant before then, we could see another wave before then. So we're not in a predictable pattern yet. And I think endemic is it's kind of like saying that this summer will be the best summer ever. You only know if it was once it's over because June might be great, but it might rain all of July. I feel like endemic is the same. We'll only know when we're in endemic, when we've been in it for a while, because we'll be able to look back and say, yes, it was predictable. We can't know before we get into it whether we'll be right on that count. And it's also worth mentioning, I think this has been said a number of times now, but that endemic doesn't necessarily mean mild. Endemic, you know, polio was endemic, smallpox was endemic. You don't want these viruses. It just meant they were predictable and they were circulating in a, in a very stable pattern. Doesn't mean that they were harmless. But I do think, I and many other scientists do think, I do think we'll get to endemic with SARS-CoV-2. It won't be a pandemic forever and we will settle into a pattern. For me, the big question is what is that gonna look like and how long and bumpy is that road? If SARS-CoV-2 has really done most of its optimization and it doesn't have a lot more tricks up its sleeve, it could be that this is it. You know, Omicron was the last big variant. We'll see some small changes so that it can continue reinfecting, but we might really settle into a more predictable pattern. Or it could be that there are some mutations out there that could increase transmissibility again, or make a big leap in how well, how much our virus doesn't recognize, how much our immune system doesn't recognize the virus. And that could mean maybe it's a few more years until we really settle in pandemic pattern. I don't think we can say ahead of time. And so for me, remaining flexible and prepared, not making promises that we can't keep to the public, making sure we have funds on hand so that we can continue reacting if we do see that things are turning in a wrong direction, we don't want to sit there repeating the mantra, the pandemic is over, when it might not be. We don't want that to delay our response if things start looking bad again. But I don't want to end on a negative note. I do think we have, you know, we have ever, ever more working in our favor. We are learning more all the time about the mutations, the epidemiology. We have amazing lab data now. People, you know, doing amazing work, being able to generate new mutations and viruses and test different antigenic panels almost in no time, it seems to me, and incredibly more accurate models. One thing that we could still work on is pulling this data together. If any of you work on SARS-CoV-2, you know how hard it is to stay even up to date with the literature from one week. We're overwhelmed with Twitter threads, with GitHub threads, with, with preprints, with publications. Knowing that you have a really full and comprehensive view on a mutation is really difficult because publications come so thick and fast. Having better ways to pull this data together would probably help us make better connections. And for me, it's also really important to remember that real world success, particularly for a virus, is complex. What was true for the last variant or for last year may or may not be true next year. We have to stay flexible in our mindsets and not think, oh, we've got this figured out, or at least I would caution against it. And for me, this is going to be particularly true as we head into a future where our immune landscapes are growing ever more heterogeneous. So we now have many people around the world that have been infected, but they've been infected with different variants. People have been vaccinated, they've been vaccinated with different vaccines at different times, with different times since they were vaccinated, boosted, not boosted, triple boosted, four, you know, four boosts or one boost, two boosts. We also have people that have been infected and vaccinated or infected twice with different variants. And of course, children, for many young children, their first exposure might be infection and then later getting vaccinated. So this all might lead to a lot of heterogeneity in how our immune systems are set up and what vulnerabilities we might have. And I already think, you know, we've seen this with Omicron, as I said earlier, Omicron caused very different amounts of concern for different countries. And future variants may be this way as well, in that future variants might not mean the same thing for every country. And we have to remain aware that just because a variant isn't necessarily a big threat for us or for another country doesn't mean that it might still be devastating somewhere else. So we have to remain flexible in our, in our opinions as well about what is a variant of concern. And then finally, I think it's really important, you know, it's very easy for us in the West to talk about you know, sequencing and doing all of these analyses, but for many places in the world, we still don't have even basic levels of molecular surveillance. And this will help us not only for this pandemic, to better understand what SARS-CoV-2 variants might be out there, might be the next variant, but also just in general. The, the labs in Africa that turned around the first SARS-CoV-2 sequences were the ones that had been um, lined up to do HIV or Ebola sequencing. They were able to really quickly switch this expertise and this equipment to sequencing SARS-CoV-2. And the same is true in reverse. 
labs that we help to equip to do SARS-CoV-2 sequencing today can use that for their own endemic pathogens tomorrow and in the future for whatever the next pathogen might be. So it's certainly an investment that's worth making. And with that, I would just like to thank Next Train, which I've been really privileged to be part of through this pandemic. And of course, my lab at the University of Bern with Christian Althaus and Martin Reichmuth and all of you for listening. And I'm very happy to take questions and have this session. Thank you so much.